Welcome to part 11 on Enlightenment in a Revolutionary World. Now we're going to talk about the fall of Napoleon. In 1812, Napoleon had become just fed up with the Russian uh, smuggling with the British, right, and their violation of staying within the confines of the continental system. And so he's going to embark on a campaign in June of 1812 to punish the Russians for not following the rules, right? He marched into Russia with an army of about 600,000 men. The Russian forces he faced avoided battle by giving up land. They continually retreated and they practiced a scorch earth policy. They burned crops and kept drawing Napoleon deeper and deeper into territory, waiting for their most powerful gen gen general to uh, arrive, General Winter. Right? After the bloody Battle of Borondino in September of 1812, Napoleon was finally able to capture Moscow. But the food stores in Moscow had been destroyed by a fire. So in August, or excuse me, in October, realizing that he couldn't stay in Moscow, he began a very long and disastrous cold retreat uh, in the Russian winter. In this retreat from uh, Moscow, only one sixth of Napoleon's army is going to survive it. This broke the spell, this belief that Napoleon was unstoppable, that it was just, it was impossible to defeat him. And you're going to see other nations begin to rise up. In the spring of 1813, Napoleon's army is going to be defeated at the Battle of Leipzig by Russian, Austrian, and Prussian forces. Also in 1813, uh, British and Spanish forces will cross the Pyrenees Mountains um, in, in uh, northern Spain into France itself, right? Numerous revolts are going to begin breaking out throughout the occupied territories and inside of France, right? Finally, on March 31st, 1814, with Allied armies approaching Paris itself, Napoleon will abdicate his throne and he will, be go, he will go into exile. He'll be placed in exile uh, on the island of Elba, but we're not quite done with him just yet. In February of 1815, Napoleon escaped Elba, and he rallied the remnants of the Imperial Army and returned to Paris, and he launched a campaign to try and split the Allied forces back in, uh, in half in Belgium. In June of 1815, though, he was finally decisively defeated by the Allies uh, at a place called Waterloo. There, the French will take 45,000 casualties. This time, Napoleon will be exile exiled to St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, uh, where he will die six years later, later of cancer. Right? The following, uh, following this, there will be uh, a large peace conference known as the Congress of Vienna, one of the most important peace conferences in European history, right? The Congress of Vienna is on the surface, is going to look like an attempt to turn the clock back and ignore those issues of liberalism and nationalism that were raised by the French Revolution, right? The Congress was dominated by five great European powers, Britain, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and now, safely a monarchy again, France, right? But there were three conservative statesmen who really did uh, dominate the Congress of Vienna. You had uh, the uh, Austrian foreign minister, Prince Clemens von Metternich. You had the British foreign minister, Robert Stuart, Viscount uh, Castlereagh. And you had the French foreign minister, uh, who was Count Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. Right. These three men are going to be the most dominant members of this Congress of Vienna. Right. Now, there was a lot of things that come out of this uh, this peace convention uh, in France. The Bourbon monar monarchy is recognized and restored. And so is the 792 borders of France. Right. To restore the balance of power, France is ringed by strong buffer states. Right. Um, the Netherlands, north of France, is enlarged to include both Belgium and Luxembourg. 
Sardinia, which used to be Savoy, is enlarged to include uh, a southern portion of France. Prussia and Saxony, the German states, are both enlarged with the former given the Rhineland uh, bordering France. Austria receives northern Italy as compensation for their loss of Austrian Netherlands. And the old Holy Roman Empire is consolidated into 38 German states, a further consolidation of these German states, right? Russia is given Finland and Poland. These two nations will cease to exist for a while. And as with the Treaty of Utrecht of 1713, Britain is going to take a lot of overseas colonies with commercial and military importance to them. Cape Colony in South Africa, right? Mauritius and Malta, right? But when we really take a close look at the Congress of Vienna, uh, we do see that not all aspects of the French Revolution had been completely repudiated. In France, for example, uh, the Bourbon monarchy was restored and Louis XVIII was crowned king, but it was a constitutional monarchy. Right, not very different from the Constitution of 1791 and a legislature elected by property owners. Uh, the revolutionary land settlements stood. Uh, Napoleonic law, the Napoleonic Code, most of it survived, as did a lot of its bureaucracy. Right, privilege of the church and the aristocracy was never restored, and in their place, the middling orders had gained identity and political power. Right, and in the whole of Europe. The ideas of liberalism and nationalism could not be stamped out. You could not reestablish the Ancien Regime. So this is going to ultimately lead to a series of revolutions between 1820 and 1848, uh, and really um, beyond that as well. Uh, liberalism demanded for accountability of government, for suffrage for many people, for free press, for equality, for individual liberty. Um, nationalism emphasized the value of one's culture and tradition and the desire for self-determination uh, amongst the different ethnic groups, especially uh, uh, some of the small ones like the Belgians or the Poles or the Baltic peoples or the Slavs or the Magyars, right? Um, the greatest achievement of the Congress of Vienna is that there's going to be no general continent-wide war in Europe again for the next 99 years. Matter of fact, the Europeans will refer to this often as the Hundred Years of Peace. I always call it the Hundred Years of Peace-ish because there's a whole bunch of little small skirmishes, just nothing that covers the entire continent. 